after all the stuff that we're covering, you're going to hear a wonderful testimony in a few minutes. And those that are staying for their prospective student dinner, I, I won't be here, but just want to say that I've had a number of grads from our ministry school come through SES and other friends and colleagues, and they've all had a really wonderful experience. They've been challenged and enriched by the profs. Uh, all the profs universally have been highly regarded. So just want to put in my two cents. Adam, anything else you wanted me to say? No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Now, one thing I appreciate about Dr. Land is how he tiptoes around the controversial issues and is so politically correct in his comments. Yeah, it's just, I'm trying to figure out what he actually means and what he actually believes. It's just so hard, it's, especially about Jesus being the only way. That I'm still trying to figure out where he stands. Uh, but it, it, is, it is wild now that when you just stand for something that everybody accepted for 2,000 years, you're now considered radical and extreme, et cetera. Uh, but sir, since you just walked in, I want you to just stand for one second, <laughs> all right? I'm going to prove in less than five seconds that gay is not the new black. No, I'm serious. I'm going to prove this in less than five seconds. Okay, are you ready? So when did you come out as black? See? Right there. There you go. Okay. We, you see that? Talking about hijacking a civil rights movement, but... Just, I just want to blow that out of the water to say, see, right out of the gate, it's not the same. Okay, get your money's worth here with Dr. Brown. Okay, thank you, Lord, for grace and truth in Jesus' name. Remember that Jesus comes full of grace and truth, and that should be who we are, people full of grace and truth, not grace or truth, grace and truth. We should have Hearts of compassion and backbones of steel, right? Hearts of compassion that really care, backbones of steel that stand for what's right. So what I want to do is take a few minutes and, and look at what Scripture says. We've been talking a lot about activism in society, and these are realities we live with. I could spend hours, months, years talking about those issues. But, but let's make sure we can understand what Scripture says about the Bible and homosexual practice, all right? And uh, I have a, a video, an animated video, less than six minutes called, Can You Be Gay and Christian? And something really interesting happened with it. Have you ever seen the videos by PragerU? Okay, great, very helpful, watched, multiplied millions of times. Well, some folks approached our ministry last year and asked, uh, could I develop videos like that? And now we, we've put out seven so far on subjects ranging from ranging from can you be gay and Christian to how did the church get cut off from its Jewish roots to uh, is Jesus kosher for Jews to uh, other issues, uh, can we trust the Bible? Uh, and I'll let you know how you can watch those on our website later. But this was the first one we put out. It came out around last May. And we had a little bit of a budget. So it's you know me talking about this animated and things like that. And now we're doing them all in-house and our, our team puts them together. So uh, for the first, excuse me, for the first time, we had uh, a little money to advertise on YouTube because the goal is to promote the video and you know, at least get 100,000 views and kind of going from there. Well, when uh, my producer worked with Google and YouTube and you pick words that you want to draw attention to because you're trying to get it to a certain audience, right? So we had Bible, conservative, Christian, but because of the subject matter, gay, homosexual, well, it was not our plan, and I would not have done this intentionally so as not to intrude on others, but it ended up being advertised on different gay and transgender YouTube channels. So, you know, you're going to flip on what you're going to watch, and a five-second ad comes on, right? So here it is. Can you be gay and Christian? Well, this created an absolute uproar. And uh, YouTube also had allowed a, a, an, an ad from the Alliance defending freedom, a video talking about Baron Stutzman's 74-year-old grandmother that was threatened with losing everything, including her, her personal you know, house, finances, everything, because she had said that she couldn't do a floral design for a gay couple, etc. So there's this uproar. And next thing you know, these transgender activists, these gay activists, they're going crazy. I mean, I mean, really having meltdowns on their YouTube channels. 
You know, how can this happen? And they're showing clips. One guy probably shows two minutes of, of our video. He's got, he's turned upside down, he changes the voice and all this, but, and we found, <coughs> we found out about it two ways. One, we started seeing all these articles coming up about it, and then these links, and two, we, our, our video starts getting flooded with the most profane attacking comments, and a lot of them saying the same things, like where are you getting the talking points from? Well, they're watching these videos. Okay, so it explodes online, and most of the major gay, lesbian, activist websites, there's my picture, there's the video, there's the link, okay? I mean, if you go there, it's probably been watched 160 something thousand times, but it's got like 7,000 likes and 5,000 dislikes, because there's this, you know, every time we get a flood of people pouring in thumbs down, let's get this guy a future, let's complain, et cetera. I've got 580,000 followers on Facebook, so I just say, hey, we need a few thumbs up here, you know, so, and just trying to generate discussion around the issues here. So it goes so far that it ends up getting written up about my video and what's happened, Business Insider, Forbes Magazine. It gets to the point that Google and YouTube put out a formal apology saying there were ads that played that were inappropriate, we apologize because of my video and the ADF video. Well, we found out a little over a month ago from a, a software engineer, a Christian at that Google, a whistleblower, that he said, let me tell you what happened. He said, there was a list of 30,000 of us employees and we're on this list, and, and the employees started putting out complaints about my video, that it was a microaggression, that it was making them uncomfortable, and it was airing during June Pride Month and all this, so it went up to VP uh, Vishal Sharma, and, and he said, look, Google stands for open expression and tolerance, but not this. So he made the decision that it couldn't be advertised anymore. So they didn't block it, but it could, it, we can't advertise it, we can't promote it. So it's constantly still being discussed. Well, I then went, oh, a few weeks ago, I went to the major gay and transgender videos that I was aware of that were attacking my video and showing clips from it, right? On those sites, it's been viewed over 30 million times. <laughs> yeah, so you talk about God having a way to get a message out, he can do it, he can really do it. And everything on the video is, is grace and truth. What the Bible says, but with grace, without anger, and with redemption, amen? We're in a situation now, think of this, things turn so far upside down that the mayor of South Bend Pete Buttigieg, right, who is not just pro-abortion to the point that he won't say late-term abortions are wrong, but he's called married to his partner and said being married to his partner has brought him closer to God because he's a devout Christian. Okay, he is critical of Vice President Mike Pence because of his Christian faith. And obviously, our president is a controversial figure. And some say, how can he be a Christian and act like this? Others, well, maybe he's a baby Christian. So I can understand Mayor Pete, as they call him, I could understand him questioning whether Trump is a Christian or not. Or Okay, I could understand that. Fine, fair question to ask. But don't call yourself a Christian as a practicing homosexual. It's also pro-abortion. You talk about the height of hypocrisy, right? But that's the situation we're in now. It's not a matter of live and let live. I began saying this 14, 15 years ago. Those who came out of the closet want to put us in the closet. It is not a matter of tolerance. Tolerance is the left's word for intolerance of all positions aside from its own. I, I was told by a company that because I have the moral stance that I do, they could not work with me because they are inclusive. <laughs> you talk about you know, Orwellian doublespeak, right? So inclusive means exclusive of all ideas outside of our own. And we're not the ones protesting on college campuses when liberal speakers come in. We're not the ones starting riots when people come in with other ideas. Some years ago, the group called GLAD, which was originally the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, now they're just called GLAD, I nicknamed the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Disagreement. They put out a, counter, a, a commentator a, uh, accountability project, CAP, with 36 conservative commentaries, commentators and they, they sent this out to all the major news networks saying, don't have these people on. I was on that list. Don't have these people on. 
because they're not representing truthful positions, they're just bigoted and biased, and they're gonna mislead your audience. If you ask me to go to a college campus and do a lecture on can you be gay and Christian, my first request is, can we get someone to debate me? Because I want people to hear both sides, and I want to contrast them. That's always my first question. Can we get someone to take the other side so we can put both things on the table? Because we got nothing to hide. Light is never afraid of darkness. Truth never runs from deception. That's always my approach, not censor the other side. Let's put the issues out on the table. So those calling for tolerance are also the ones saying, throw them to the lions, the ones likening us to ISIS. And when Kim Davis was put in jail for disobeying the judge's order to issue marriage certificates to a same-sex couple, when she went to jail for that, there were people cheering it. She belongs in jail. That's good. When I began to say those who came out of the closet want to put us in the closet, people mocked me and said it's not true. A few years ago, they changed it to bigots like you belong in the closet. And they say, we are intolerant of, of racists. We are intolerant of bigots. We are intolerant of, of homophobes. So it's, it's looked at as a good thing. So you're talking about calling evil good and calling good evil. The question is, do we know how to open this up from Scripture? We understand the calling to be compassionate and gracious. We, we understand that Jesus died for all the same and that all are offered grace and forgiveness the same and new life in him. But can we make our case scripturally? Can we respond when people push back? All right? So let's go to the book of Genesis. We started in the first chapter talking about gender distinctions, male and female. He created us. We talked about the commission where it says in Hebrew, peru, revu, and the to arts, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, that that can only be given to a heterosexual couple. But the homosexual argument would be, well, where to, fine. Heterosexual is going to reproduce. The earth has got a lot of people. We're not hurting anyone by living how we live. And it's all about love. So let's go to Genesis 2.17. Excuse me, 2.18. The Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. So I've heard gay activists and their allies say, look, God says it's not good for us to be alone. And he made us for companionship. He didn't make us to be alone. It's not good for the man to be alone. And if the only companionship and intimacy I can have is with someone of the same sex, how can you deny that when God himself says it's not good for the man to be alone? But, but notice what's written afterwards. I will make him a helper fit for him. I will make him a helper fit for him. Notice it doesn't say a companion, but a helper. Now, when I taught about this on my six-minute video, and I referenced this, it got a flood of comments. You call a woman helper? You say a woman just helper? Who are you talking about? Well, it was from one video where the guy drew attention to it, so suddenly that became the big talking point. But, but listen, it was not just a matter of Adam being alone. It was a matter of Adam having a commission to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and without a woman, he can't do it. It wasn't that the Garden of Eden was really big, so he needed a helper, you know, to work the garden, okay? That, that man alone and woman alone cannot fulfill the, the plan of God. So a suitable helper, all right? Why did he need a helper? What is it that he could not do alone? Procreate and, and, and fulfill that mandate. So I'm just saying the way God designed it and his purpose for couples. Now, all the animals are presented. There's no suitable helper, no, no one fitting. God takes one of his ribs out of his side. And then verse 22, in the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, Isha, because she was taken out of man, Ish. Okay, so you call her Isha, woman, because she's taken out of the man, Ish. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife are both naked, we're not ashamed. Why is it? that the two can become one. They were one. The woman is taken out of the man, and when the two come together, they now become one flesh in a unique way. Man plus man, or woman plus woman, cannot equal man plus woman. You know the, the books, I never read of them, but I read any of them, but the, the title, you know, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. All right, so Mars plus Mars, or Venus plus Venus, does not equal Mars plus Venus, all right? We are made uniquely and differently biologically, spiritually, emotionally. 
And it's those two becoming one that bring that sacred union. I debated a gentleman on a college campus in Florida some years ago. Uh, it was an uproar over the debate. University presidents, vice presidents almost shut the thing down. This was before the Supreme Court had the audacity to redefine marriage. So the law of the land in Florida then, back in 2011 or so when we did the debate, was that marriage was the union of a man and a woman. And that was our discussion. Uh, it, should same-sex marriage be legal? And it created so much controversy that we, we had a four policemen present to even do the debate. The university required it. But when I debated this gentleman, I just asked him, I said, I'm just curious about one thing. If marriage is not the unique union of one man and one woman, why does it have to be two people? No, I mean, really, why can't it be three or four or eight? Or do you know what sologamy is? No? Sologamy. It's, it's actually growing. There's even a sologamy industry. It is to marry yourself. Self-marriage. Why be disappointed with someone else? <laughs> really? Take yourself out to dinner, buy yourself presents. I mean, these are actual quotes from people. You know, there was one, one sologamous, so there are even sologamy industry and people, you know, doing the wedding stuff and all this. And there was one boy, 11 years old, and at his mother's wedding to herself, with 40 or 50 people attending, he said, Mom, I love you, but you're embarrassing me. <laughs> ah, wisdom from an 11-year-old. Uh, but, but why not? By definition, what, why not? Well, because marriage... Is, is not about one person, it's about two. Well, why two? Why is that a magic number? There's now what's called the thruple. This is a recognized thing, you know, three people. But why not? Based on, based on what? And, and the, you know, the professor had no answer and said, well, I'm not going to go there. You know, we're not talking about polygamy. I said, I'm just asking you a question. If it's not the unique union of a man and a woman, and what they bring together in their unique differences, then why two? But not only so, here's something really interesting. We're often asked, if this is so important, then why doesn't the Bible address it more? I mean, the way we talk about it all the time, you'd think it was the biggest issue. Now, the reason we talk about it all the time is because it's knocking on our door day and night. It's, it's you know, the, the water's coming in the boat. We're, we're emptying the water out. We didn't go looking for this. This is, listen to me. If, if you gave me 10,000 topics... And so just pick any of these and devote years to researching it, writing it, and speaking on it. I wouldn't have picked this, OK? Who, who would? And the pain that it causes and, and, and the difficult issues you have to deal with, all right? This came to us. The activists came to our door. Our children come home with, with books you know, a, a, about same-sex couples. One of the students that was in our school over 10 years ago, she had to leave where she was teaching. She worked at a nursery school in Charlotte, highly rated. And she was not allowed to say boys or girls because that would be making a gender distinction. She had to address the kids as friends. And she was required to read. These are kids four years old. She was required to read same-sex stories to them. So she couldn't do it, so she left the job. This came knocking at our door. It is the constant push of media, the constant push in every branch of our society. We're just responding. But the question is, if it's so important and foundational, then why do you have the so-called six clobber passages, just a few passages that address it so strongly, if it's so important? My friend Larry Tomzak, also an excellent cultural commentator, made a really interesting observation. And, and, and it's very powerful when you understand it. Let's say that you decided to put together a cookbook of healthy dessert recipes. And at the beginning, you explain, look, we don't believe in using refined sugar. We think it's really unhealthy. But we have all kinds of healthy alternatives and dates and other things that make things sweet. So you won't find any recipes with sugar at all, no sugar in it, in any recipe. So you, you have the book, you know, an e-book, and you, you search for the word sugar and find out it only occurs five times. And only at the beginning of the book, from which you conclude that sugar is not important to the author. No, quite the contrary. Because it's so important and it's looked at as negative, it is left out of every single recipe in the book. And the only time it's mentioned is negative. Every single reference in the Bible to marriage, to family, to parents is heterosexual. Be it a parable about marriage, be it the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother, 
be it Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives, wives submit to your husbands, be it any passage related to that, it always presupposes heterosexuality. Even the marriages that did not reflect God's idea, like polygamists and things like that, or men with concubines, it was still all male-female. So sugar is left out of every recipe in the book. All right, Homosexuality is left out of every single recipe for marriage, for family, in the book, in God's book. And not only so, it presupposes heterosexuality. Husbands love your wives. Well, who's the husband, who's the wife? I don't say that to demean a same-sex couple. I say it to say it wasn't written for them. You ever try to fix something on your phone? It's like, oh, it's the wrong operating system. You know how to do this? Ah, you got Apple, I got, I got Android or something. Well, the operating system is heterosexual in the Bible. It's what God designed. That's how he designed it bio biologically. That's how he set things up. And then every so often, there's a reference to homosexual practice, and it is always only negative and extremely strong terms. So every reference is stri strictly condemned in terms of the practice. Every positive reference to any relationship is heterosexual. There's not one single verse that a, a practicing homosexual can truly cling to in context that justifies a gay relationship. Now, many would point to Sodom and Gomorrah <coughs> as an example singled out for homosexual practice, and certainly the manifestation of sin was an attempt at homosexual gang rape. And yes, it was an abusive act toward visitors, strangers. But gay activists would say, according to Ezekiel 16, that wasn't the issue in Sodom, and we're misusing the passage. So let's just take a look over in Ezekiel 16 and, and notice what's written there. Ezekiel 16, beginning in Verse 48, as I live, declares the Lord God, your sister Sodom, so he's speaking to Judah, and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty and did an abomination before me, so I removed them when I saw it. Was the principal sin of Sodom homosexual practice? No. There are other sins that are listed that were, were issues there and, and being at ease and proud and uncaring for the poor. But then it says, and did an abomination. The, the word abomination there is the same as in Leviticus 18.22 or Leviticus 20.13, which, which speak of homosexual practice as detestable or an abomination. And that's clearly what Ezekiel has in mind using the same word. So you could say this was the manifestation of sin. The fact that you had an out-of-control, raging homosexual lust among the men was the manifestation of the other sins. But you could look at America in very parallel ways, with us being at ease and content and haughty and often not caring for the poor, etc. And then you see the manifestation with the sexual lusts and things. But let's take a look in Leviticus 18, because this is a verse that we often quote. And when people don't listen, then we quote it again in King James. And when they still don't listen, we put it on big signs and hold it up. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily answer questions. And the fundamental question is, okay, it says in Leviticus 18 that it's an abomination for a man to lie with a man, but do you live by the rest of Leviticus? Do you live by the food laws of Leviticus? Do you live by the other purity regulations of, of Leviticus? Do your woman in a monthly cycle live by the laws in Leviticus? And most Christians, as they're sitting there having their you know, bacon cheeseburger, don't have an answer. So here's what's important to understand, that Leviticus 18 was not just for Israel. So this is a real simple principle. God gave some laws to Israel to keep them separate from the nations. Give me some examples. Yeah, okay, dietary laws, right? That's going to bring a separation. You can't sit and have table fellowship. What else would be a, a law that is not based on morality, or spiritual truth, but simply to keep separate. Okay, so cutting a beard a certain way, or not wearing garments that are mixed fabric, or sowing different seeds in a field. These are just separation laws, so Israel's constantly conscious, we're chosen, we're called, we have to be separated. But in and of themselves, they're not moral law. In other words, if, if your eyes were closed and someone fed you bacon, it doesn't spiritually defile you, right? 
but if you're you know, hearing all kinds of profanity and it's just saturated with it, that's, that's like you can feel defiling, right? So there are some laws God gave to Israel just to keep them separate from the nations. And there are other laws God gave to Israel based on universal moral principles, like don't murder or don't commit adultery. You say, okay, I like the principle, but how do I distinguish one from the other? Well, it's easy. It's easy. The Bible tells you. You say, where? You have to buy the Dr. Brown study Bible. No, no, <laughs> you don't have to, okay? And we haven't written it yet. No, but we, we, all, we do want to work on a Messianic Jewish apologetic prophecy Bible one day, but just haven't gotten to it yet. In other words, adding study notes, not writing a new Bible. Just to be clear, Dr. Land, hope you heard that. We're not talking about writing a new Bible. <clears throat> when a law is given to Israel, if it is just given to Israel only, if it is not repeated in the New Testament, or in the Old Testament is not applied to everybody, then you know it's just for Israel. doesn't mean it's wrong to keep it. It's fine to keep the dietary laws, but you're not morally bound to, all right? So, for example, Genesis 9, 6, after the flood, God says that whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, because man's created in the image of God. So there is a universal prohibition against murder for the entire human race, right? Wrong for everybody. Or you read, for example, the first one and a half chapters in Amos, and, and it's talking about the sins of the surrounding nations. God didn't judge them based on dietary laws or based on <laughs> garments. He judged them based on breaking covenants with each other, acts of cruelty and barbarity and things like that. So there are universal moral principles for which God will judge the world. And those are repeated, and we're called to follow them in the New Testament. But if it's just given to Israel, if it's not given for the whole world, if the world is not judged by it in the Old Testament, if it's not repeated in the New Testament, then it's just for Israel. So if someone says, well, why do you quote Leviticus 18, but you don't keep the dietary laws of Leviticus 11, if, if in fact you don't, you say, well, God gave those laws just for Israel. How do you know? Because he tells us in Leviticus 18 that this is for everybody. So let's take a look. At the end of, of the chapter, verse 24, and what does the chapter mainly cover? What's the biggest focus of sexual prohibitions in Leviticus 18? Anyone know? Incest. Incestuous relations. So, so, so here's the deal. If this is not for everybody, if this was just for Israel, then where, pray tell, does it say that incest is wrong in the Bible? If you want to throw this whole chapter out and say it was just for Israel, then where in the Bible does it prohibit incest? Forget culture. Where in the Bible does it prohibit incest if you throw this out? No, these are universal moral principles. Verse 24, do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things, for by all these the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean. And the land became unclean so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. So God judged the Canaanites for this. And by the way, I wasn't checking my messages. I was trying to get my, the clock to come up on my phone so I could see what time it was. I was also checking the masters to see how Tiger Woods was doing, but that's another subject. No, okay. So look, the land became defiled. The Canaanite nations practiced these things. Therefore, God drove them out. Then Israel's told, don't do it, or the land will drive you out, will vomit you out. So this is not just for Israel. This is for all people, and it's repeated in the New Testament. So... Leviticus 18, 22, you shall not lie with a man or male is with a woman. It's an abomination. So one response to this by gay theologians would be, but, but look, look, suddenly it introduces idolatry in verse 21. Don't give any of your children to offer them to Molech, so burn them in the fire, and so profane the name of your God, I'm the Lord. This had to do with a practice at pagan temples where men would lie with men. That's what it's talking about. It's in the context of idolatry. Well, how about verse 23, the next verse that prohibits bestiality? Is bestiality only wrong if you do it in an idol temple? Okay, so that argument breaks down. It's also said, well, look, in the Bible, they were dealing with promiscuity. They were dealing with prostitution. They were dealing with pederasty. But they weren't dealing with committed, loving, monogamous, same-sex relations. So... 
they had no template for that, therefore you cannot apply what they were dealing with with what we're dealing with. A first problem with that is it, it challenges the idea that the Holy Spirit actually inspired the writers. Yeah, the Holy Spirit wasn't aware of these other issues and therefore put this misleading stuff in the Bible. It creates a lot of issues about that. Secondly, it fails to realize that the act is wrong because it's contrary to God's design. So if, if God says it's detestable, it doesn't become less detestable if you do it 100 times with a person you love. Okay, that doesn't change the nature of it. Uh, you, you can be madly in love with the person you're committing adultery with, but it's still sinful no matter how long you're together and how long you do it. We're sometimes told, yeah, 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 but don't exaggerate this. Abomination sounds bad to us, but the Hebrew toeva, it can, it can mean ritual uh, unacceptability. For example, the children of Israel, when, when they moved into Egypt, Joseph tells them, hey, tell them your shepherds because that's detestable. That's toeva. It's abomination. You know, we, we have a problem with that, but it's not actually morally wrong. Well, well, hang on. The sins spoken of here are morally wrong. Incest is morally wrong. Adultery is morally wrong. Bestiality is morally wrong. And the Hebrew toeva is the same word used, for example, in Proverbs 6, that there's six things God hates, seven that are detestable to him. You know, like shedding of innocent blood. That, it can be used for something that is morally wrong. And here's something interesting. We don't know how far back these Jewish traditions go. We know they're after the time of Jesus, but many of them date back many centuries. But there are a few Jewish traditions that indicate that one of the reasons that God destroyed the earth in Noah's day was because men were marrying men. They were actually you know, giving out marriage certificates. So again, we don't know exactly how far back that goes, but it is to say that in the ancient world, there was certainly concept of, of same-sex relationships that were supposed to be monogamous and committed. You know, you have Nero has, has a marriage to his, his male lover. The, the world in which Paul lived is very similar to the world in which we live. And, and what was happening in many of the Greek cities, similar to what we're dealing with here. So it's quite a misnomer to say, well, Moses didn't know about it, or Jesus didn't know about it, or Paul didn't know about it. Number one, the Holy Spirit knew about it, and the Holy Spirit is inspiring these words. And certainly, in the love and grace and care and compassion of God, he would not have put verses like this in the Bible that would be so misused to hurt people for so long unless homosexual practice was actually wrong. And let's think about Jesus for a minute. Are you telling me that the Son of God, who according to John 2, 24 and 25, knew what was in all men? He could answer your thought. You think a thought and he answers it that he didn't know what was in the heart of a same-sex attracted person. I, I, I actually debated a gay guy over this, and his supporters said, yeah, Jesus probably didn't know. In other words, better to change Jesus than to change our views. Better to degrade him as the son of God. But you say, okay, but speaking of Jesus, why doesn't he mention it if it's so important? That's true. For that matter, what did Jesus say about Martians? What did Jesus say about wife beating? What did Jesus say about opioid addiction? The fact that he doesn't address something specifically in and of itself proves nothing. I can prove to you that Jesus believed Elvis is alive. Did he ever deny it? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's like the guy standing on a street corner in New York City going like this. He said, what are you doing? He said, I'm, I'm keeping the crocodiles away. He said, they're like, like no hot crocodiles for hundreds of miles. He goes, see? Okay, so in point of fact, there was no ambiguity in his day about this. And in fact, Judaism of that day was more vehemently opposed to homosexual practice than even the Hebrew Bible was. There was no ambiguity anymore than you need to go up to Dr. Land and say, now, Dr. Land, tell me uh, Satanism, good or bad? You know, you know, it's not like an ambiguous question. We don't know where he stands. And if it was so important, how come he hasn't mentioned it yet today? All right, so you... You see, it's a complete fallacy, the argument for silence. But in three different ways, Jesus does address this. And it's interesting, when, a few years back when I was on Piers Morgan, who I mentioned earlier, and of course he challenged me, you know, so, so where, show me, you know, where did Jesus say anything about gay or being gay? So first I explain why you can't use the argument from silence. He says, give me one, one verse. I said, I'll give you three. So the first place is Matthew 5, beginning verse 17. Matthew 5, 17 to 20 where Jesus explains, I didn't come to abolish the law of the prophets, but to fulfill, right? 
So how does he fulfill? Well, for example, everything having to do with sacrifice, offering, priestly ministry, he takes to a higher level by dying for our sins and becoming our great high priest and fulfills the sacrificial system. What does he do with the moral requirements of the law? You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I'm telling you, don't commit adultery in your heart. You've heard it said, don't murder. I'm telling you, don't hate, right? So he takes the moral standards to a higher level, okay? That's the first thing. So in terms of the morality of the Torah, he doesn't abolish it. He takes it to a higher level. Second thing, in Matthew 15, verse 19, he's explaining how what you eat doesn't spiritually defile you because it goes in your mouth and passes out of your body. But what comes out of your heart defiles. And he, he lists a number of different sins, including porneia, sexual immorality, but it's plural in the Greek. That refers to all sexual acts outside of wedlock. I mean, to, to use the word is pretty broad because you already have adultery, right? But now you have that. But in the plural, all sexual acts outside of marriage defile. That's the second thing. And of course, there's no debate at that time that, that homosexual practice was considered sin. But let's go one step further. In Matthew 19, Matthew 19, 4 through 6, when the question of divorce comes up, and, and, and Dr. Land references this as well, when the question of divorce comes up, Jesus refers back to the beginning and says, this is the way God intended at the beginning, that one man, one woman join together for life. And what God's joined together, don't let anyone separate. So he tells us what marriage is in Matthew 19. He tells us all sexual acts outside of marriage defile in, in Matthew 15. And Matthew 5, he tells us that he takes the moral standards of the law all through the Sermon on the Mount to a higher level. People say, well, well hang on, hang on. In Matthew 19, in that very same chapter, when the disciples here is teaching about divorce and get a little skittish and like, well, maybe we shouldn't even marry, he said, well, it's not given to everybody. He said, there's some who are born eunuchs, meaning what? They have no sexual capacity, all right? No sexual capacity. Others are made eunuchs by men, meaning a man would be castrated, right? So there's, it becomes passive in his personality and different things, but then no sexual capacity, no sexual desire. And then those who made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of God, not meaning literally castrated themselves like Origen did many centuries ago, but saying, I'll never marry or have sex, and I'm separated to God. You say, well, how, how could gay activists use this? Here's their argument. They say in the ancient world that if you were, say, a man, same-sex attracted in the Jewish world, because it was taboo to act on that, people would just think, oh, you're not, you're not interested in women. You, you must be a eunuch. So that included in the term eunuch would have been people who were same-sex attracted. And Jesus is saying, you're born that way. Well, well, first, he wasn't saying that people are born same-sex attracted. He was talking about people without sexual capacity. And even if, in the eyes of the general public, if you were same-sex attracted, you might have been mistaken for a eunuch, what did it mean, though, in what Jesus is saying? No sex, no marriage for life. So for gay activists to try to use it is, is butchering the text on every front. When, and, and, and you want to know how far gay activists go with some of their arguments? They will actually try to use when Jesus healed the centurion's servant to, to argue that that was like his boy toy lover. And, and, and we know that because, you know, Luke tells us that he's very valuable to me. And, and the, the Greek word used, pais, uh, means servant, but it, it can have, it can have uh, implications of, of being like a sexual, sexual servant or something like that. So when the guy says to Jesus, you know, my, my servant's really valuable to me, he's, he's, he's really sick, Jesus is like, you got it, man. We're good on this. Little wink, go home, he's well. So aside from the fact that the woman caught in adultery, he tells, go and sin no more, and, and the guy having sex with his boy toy, he heals so he can keep having sex, aside from the utter absurdity and obscenity of that, the fact is that every single time the Greek word pice is used in the New Testament, and in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, every time without exception, it means servant with no sexual connotation of any kind. Jesus is the pice of the Father, the servant. So on every level, you realize the straws that people are grasping at. You know, with the Jonathan David argument. You know, and, and look, there's ample proof in Scripture that David was not gay. The guy gets in trouble for lusting after a woman. It's one thing to say, well, he just went on with marriage so it would look good. Well, you don't keep picking more wives then. 
and then get in big trouble because you're lusting after another woman. And Jonathan himself is married. You say they kissed. Everybody in the Bible kissed. We're supposed to greet one another with a holy kiss. But look, if you want to talk about a sensual kiss, the Bible does not do that. And if you want to talk about sexual activity, there's no word having to do with sexual activity in any of the narratives. It's just covenantal love and relationship. That's another weakness of of the the gay mindset and worldview is it can't recognize just real, genuine, non-sexual love between two brothers or two sisters. When it comes to Paul... Romans 1 is an important passage because it explicitly mentions lesbian practice, female, female practice. You say, well, how in the world do, do gay activists deal with that? Okay, um, first, verse 24, so here's the cycle. Beginning of verse 18, the wrath of God revealed against sinful men. Human beings, the human race say no to God, worship idols, so he gives us over to our folly when we don't repent. He gives us over to even more folly, so we worship the created things rather than the creator. And when we still don't repent, he now gives us over to sexual immorality. When we still don't repent over to sexual perversion. When we still don't repent to every kind of fleshly sin which characterizes the human race, which is what we have in verse 29. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, etc. So, verse 26, for this reason, because of our refusal to retain the knowledge of God, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Okay, number one, gay activists say, no, no, no. This is not talking about loving, committed, same-sex relations. Obviously, this is people just out of control and lust. It has to do with sins taking place in an idolatrous temple. That's what, it's in the context of idolatry. Well, no. No more than all the other sins listed here are only in the context of idolatry, like hatred and malice and envy and murder, etc. This is the state of the human race given over to sin. All. Oh, no, no, no. You're missing the point. It says they did things contrary to nature. Contrary to nature. So I, as a heterosexual man, it's contrary to my nature to be attracted to another man. And a heterosexual woman, contrary to her nature to be attracted to another woman. So Paul's saying that the heterosexuals engaged in so much sexual passion, sin, and idolatry that God gave them over, heterosexuals, to do what was contrary to their nature, therefore Homosexual relations, that's the argument. Now, the first problem you might have with that if you study the history of interpretation of Romans is that no one ever came up with that before the sexual revolution. (laughs) Never dawned on a single commentator. And you've got all kinds of commentators from all backgrounds commentating on the Bible. That's the first problem. Second problem is that the language Paul uses in Romans 1, as Professor Robert Gagnon points out in great detail, The language Paul's using here in Romans 1 is going right back to Genesis 1. Now, I read it as translated in in the ESV, and this is common in most translations, but Paul doesn't say, for their women exchange natural relations, and the men, no, he says, for the females exchange natural relations, and the males likewise gave up natural relations. The only time Paul speaks of males and females using those Greek words is like Galatians 3.28, there's neither male nor female in Jesus, right? Here, he's using male, female, because he's going back to Genesis 1. God created us male and female. He's saying it's contrary to the nature of a male to be with a male, and contrary to the nature of a female to be with a female, contrary to our created nature, to the the nature that God set in place. And and there are about seven parallels. If you read the Greek translation of Genesis 1, the Septuagint, and compare it to Romans 1, about seven parallels in the language. Paul's going back to Romans 1 and saying people who do this are doing it contrary to our created design. And then, of course, in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, Paul gives a list of sins and says those who live in these, those who practice these, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And if you read in the King James, it it mentions effeminate and abuses of themselves with mankind, older NIV, homosexual offenders. What exactly does that mean? There are two Greek words, and to simplify the discussion, when used together, even many gay theologians and activists say used together, they're clearly speaking of homosexual practice. And that's why some translations, like the modern translations, like the ESV, 
just term it men who practice homosexuality. Put the two words together. And I own, because of my, my PhD in Near Eastern languages and literatures, I got really into languages. So even though I'm not a scholar in Greek, I own every major lexicon uh, of the ancient Greek language and biblical Greek, et cetera. And, and every single one, especially for the second term, every one without exception agrees it's talking about homosexual practice. Not specifically pederasty, not, not uh, specifically prostitution, promiscuity, no, no, just homosexual practice. The good news is, verse 11, and such were some of you, that you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, and by the Spirit of our God. I started my first session talking about the compassion we need, reach out with compassion, resist with courage, the sensitivity that we need, the rejection that, that many who identify as LGBT have experienced in the church or in their family. And, and we sometimes think we're being really sensitive and say, well, we, we love the, the sinner, but we hate the sin. But what you'll have a gay person tell you is, well, it sounds like you hate me because this is who I am. They're not thinking this is what I do. They're thinking this is who I am. But what Paul's saying is such were some of you. Now, does that mean you went from homosexual to heterosexual? In some cases, yes. I have, I have friends of mine that through supernatural intervention in their lives or deep ministry and counseling literally went from homosexual to heterosexual and have been happily married for decades and are blessed. I know others that by the work of the Spirit in their lives or again counseling or, or the Word of God that over a period of time they saw their same-sex attractions diminish, diminish, diminish and found themselves attracted to at least one person from the opposite sex. You know, one guy, I read his story and he said, you know, when he came out of homosexuality, he said, all the guys I know, though, they're so consumed with lust for women. So he prayed, let me be attracted to the woman I'm going to marry. So that's, that's a great one. That's an amazing prayer. That's what happened to him. So I know some, they still struggle time to time. They, they may be attracted a little bit. They say no to it. The spouse knows, and they're happily married, and they're thriving. And then I know others who say, you know, I haven't really seen a change in my attractions, but I'm honoring God. I say no to them. And listen, didn't Jesus say... If you want to follow me, you've got to deny yourself, right? One brother in England who says, yeah, I, I'm still same-sex attracted, but I say no to it. I don't affirm it. It's wrong. I don't give place to it. I deny it. I walk in holiness. People say, that must be so hard. Now, I'm not going to answer that because that's not my situation. Let him answer. And, and he says, well, Jesus requires everything from all of us. He requires everything from all all of us, he said, and Jesus is enough for all of us. You know, what happens to a man, he's married, young couple in their 20s, and, and the wife gets in a terrible car wreck and is now paralyzed and is an invalid for the rest of his life. There's no grounds for divorce, right? He'll have no sexual relationship with her the rest of her life. She may be limited. Can God give grace to endure a 60-year marriage? Like, yeah, God gives grace in all kinds of situations, and that's what we need to, to say. That being said, if someone says, can you be gay and Christian, if by that you mean, can you practice homosexuality and follow Jesus at the same time, categorically no. If you mean, hey, I, I'm, I'm tempted in this way, I don't identify as gay, it's not who I am, I say no to the flesh, and I'm following Jesus, of course you can follow him. Every one of us has some fleshly weakness or struggle. One of the great errors, though, and this is what we must push against a, a gay identity in the church, is to say, this is who I am. No, 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 the, the, the fleshly struggles, that, they don't define you. What defines you is I'm a child of God. I'm born again. I'm washed in the blood of Jesus. I've been declared righteous. I'm empowered by the Spirit to live for him. That's who you are. Am I, I, am, I am Michael Brown. I am a proud Christian. I am Michael Brown. I am an adulterous Christian. I am Michael Brown. I am a greedy Christian because we struggle. In, no, so why? When we say, no, but we're trying to be open and honest. No, we're taking on the mentality and mindset of the world to make this an identity. That's half the battle to say, it's not who you are. I, I, I was speaking about 6,000 young people in Singapore a few years ago, and, and we did a Q&A session. So the question, okay, what happens if your best friend says, I got to tell you something really heavy. You know, I'm gay. I said, here's what you say to them. I thought you had something heavy to tell them. What else are you going to, what else? Well, that's it. It's like, well, you're my friend. I said, here's an area of your struggle. That's not who you are. You're my friend. So let's, Let's just love Jesus together, and, and we'll, we'll work this out. And, and, and what do you tell your kids 
if, if, and I'm sorry I'm running slightly late here and I promised time for, in fact, Cami can answer all the questions, she will answer, <laughs> all right? She'll answer all your questions. Okay, uh, I, I, I was in Cincinnati where I was asked to speak on this one time, and I come up to a couple afterwards, and the wife's crying, and the husband's all upset. So our daughter came out, she said she's gay. How old is she? 16. I said, where is she? She said, well, at, at her aunt's house. I said, why? I said, well, we kicked her out. I said, you kicked her out. I said, you know how hard it was for her to open up and tell you this? And she's using the vocabulary she knows. I'm gay. I said, she didn't, she didn't come in there with her lesbian girlfriend and sleep in that. I said, you get that girl and you bring her right back. And you say, look, you're our daughter. You're always going to be our daughter, period. We love you. Now, look, you know what we believe about this and what we understand the Bible says, but we, you're our daughter. We love you. And whatever's going on in your life, we want to be involved. We're here. Last thing, we're often told that Jesus was inclusive, Right? He reached out to everybody. Right, right, but, but hang on. He did not practice affirmational inclusion. He didn't go up to the prostitutes and say, hey, ladies, let me tell you how to get more money. <laughs> you know, to the corrupt tax collectors. All right, boys, we're going to really make this into a racket. No, no. He didn't practice affirmational inclusion. When God reached out to me when I was a heroin shooting 16 year old rebel, he didn't say, well done, son. No, he said, repent. All right. Jesus practices transformational inclusion. He reaches out to people right where they are and sits and hangs out with sinners and to the point they want to hang out with him, and then he changes them. Transformational inclusion, that's the gospel. And, and our goal, even though it would be wonderful to see someone come into a full heterosexual relationship and, and things like that, the goal that we shoot for is holiness. That, that's the ultimate goal. That's what we want to introduce people to. So, you know, some 19-year-old guy gets saved and he's come out of homosexuality and, and you think, okay, you know, my sister, she's 19 and she's really pretty and she loves Jesus. has a great personality and she's not going with anyone. Maybe she can cure him. No, that, you're going to get everybody confused with that. Discipleship, holiness, that's the goal. And these other things can sort themselves out along the way. Okay, listen, here's my website if, if you don't follow me. It's askdrbrown, A-S-K-D-R-Brown.org. Askdrbrown.org. The videos I mentioned is called Consider This. You'll see a link right on the homepage. But we, I normally write five articles a week, like op-ed pieces and things, what's going on in the world around us. Then we have our daily radio show, which, which airs uh, across the country, but, but here between 3 and 4 in the afternoon. We do a live stream on Facebook, YouTube. We're super active. There are thousands of hours of free resources on the website. So when you go there, ask Dr. Brown, askdrbrown.org, you can download an app to, to watch the show or listen to the show. Uh, you check out the digital library or connect with me. There are links for Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all that there to connect, all right? So let, let us be of service to you. It's, it's, it's not the major thing we do, but it is part of what we do. So let us be of service to you. We, we put out a lot on this. This way you can share it with others. Just one warning. This may shock you when you start sharing some of my stuff, but not everyone likes me. <laughs> so the moment you start sharing my stuff, you suddenly enter into the world of, of controversy. Uh, and Dr. Lane, I'm still trying to figure out if you think there are many ways to God or not, because you were so <laughs> ambiguous in that earlier talk. But with that, I'll close. So you tell us, what, do we have time for a couple of questions or no? That's up to you. We're a little bit over, but we'll oh, take I'm, take I'm, a couple if you want. Yeah, let's let's do it. Okay. I just want to know one question. What about these Catholic priests? They make their commitments to God, but yet they molested these young boys. Right. So, uh, of course, any of us who are in ministry are more accountable. And, and when it's an authority figure you look to spiritually, I mean, that's that's a horrific thing. It's a horrific thing. But but here's the deal. And obviously, I'm I'm not Catholic. Uh, and, and the school here is not Catholic. The big problem is when you mandate it that priests cannot marry, which is an unscriptural thing. And now it's quite openly recognized. I mean, those that are honest, even some cardinals opening up and speaking about it, even Pope Benedict, the former pope, has put out a, a statement. Uh, but the big problem was allowing homosexual activist priests. There's a whole strong movement. And you have to realize the majority of the abuse was not a priest molesting a three-year-old girl or boy. It was a priest molesting a 14-year-old. These were homosexual acts. 
Th these were, you couldn't just say pederasty. These were same-sex attracted uh, acts. And there is a whole culture within the seminaries, among some of the highest clergy, that practices this and affirms it. And, and it's a cancer. Now, look, we, we have enough scandals in, in our own midst as evangelicals. So this is not to, to just indict Catholicism. The problem is when you set up something that says you cannot marry, so you're going to get a higher percentage of guys that the reason they can't marry is because they're attracted to guys. And now you have that as a culture, and now you have activists affirming it. It's the plague that we're currently seeing. And it, it is a homosexual issue. It is not primarily a pederast issue. It is primarily a homosexual issue in, in the Catholic Church, sadly. Uh, yes, sir? One more. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Like a stripper, and they were giving him dollars, and then another little kid posing with a guy who was naked or something. And yep. You're now like there was a TED talk about minor attracted persons. Was the terminology changed? It's so terrifying. Is that where we're going next, or what do you think will be seen in five years? Oh, okay. Uh, if there isn't a spiritual and cultural awakening, we are headed into social and moral chaos. The, the big fad right now is drag queens reading to toddlers in libraries. I mean, who could who have imagined this? And, and, and two already that were in Houston have, have been exposed as, as sex offenders. But you, you got men in full drag, you know, drag queens reading to two and three year olds in, in libraries. By the way, it, it, happened, it happened in North Carolina like two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it happened without, and the thing like sold out instantly, okay? Um, so you've got things being completely turned on the head. Incest is now kind of a hot thing. Uh, I don't watch the, the series, but Game of Thrones, one of the major couples is a brother-sister couple you know, that had you know, have sex and had kids. I've documented that in, in uh, the, the Outlast in the Gay Revolution book. You know, uh, in fact, year, back in my Queer Thing Happened to America book in 2011, we, we already were talking about the, the push for, for incest. Um, What's the media been pushing in terms of marriage, sister wives, big love, my five wives? Uh, in a two-year period, Gallup documented that support for polygamy in America went from 7% to 14%. Um, polyamory, you know, just mutual consensual loving relations, is, you know, uh, married and dating, that was already a reality show. Uh, and, and it's called intergenerational intimacy. Um, and I, I have a, a chapter in The Queer Thing Happened to America, which we're reprinting now, um, where I take the eight major arguments of pederasts and show how they parallel the major arguments of gay activists, not to parallel the acts. In other words, not to say a man abusing a three-year-old is the same as two men consensually sinning with each other. Obviously both wrong, but on a different level. Uh, but the, the major arguments are being raised, you know, intergenerational intimacy, et cetera. So we, we still have taboos about that in our society, but there'll be a greater push for lowering the age of consent uh, there'll be a greater justification. There are already articles written like sympathy for the pedophile because in point of fact, uh, science now says we think it's innate and immutable with them. They're born this way and they can't change. So if that's an argument for, for gays to use, why can't someone else use it? Even to say, okay, it's not right for us to abuse, but what about mutual loving relations? And, and quite a few of the gay activist pioneers actually said, yeah, that, that was what mentored me. That was really important when I was 10 or 11 you know, to have a 30-year-old mentor bringing me into these things. So the unthinkable will continue to become where, where we go. The good news is it gets so extreme that people are waking up. The bad news is we've been so drugged that by the time we wake up, we've lost all sensitivity. So it's, to me, in this critical little window now where, where it's just going completely off you know, the, the edge of the waterfall, and, and there's still time for cultural awakening. Otherwise, you're going to have a whole generation crash and burn you then have to rebuild from. So it, you know, as serious as can be. And, and again, if you think we're crazy, go back five years ago, 10 years ago, if we were saying what we're talking about today, you would have thought we were crazy, right? The good news is God's at work. People are being saved, lives are being changed, but now's the time to stand and speak. The fact you made the investment of your time and energy to come here, so God's put things in you so that you can make a difference in your communities, amen? All right, thanks folks, appreciate it.